Time Fuse by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Time Fuse by Randall Garrett. This story was first published in If Worlds of Science Fiction, March 1954. Commander Benedict kept his eyes on the rear plate as he activated the intercom. All right, cut the power. We ought to be safe enough here. As he released the intercom, Dr. Leitcher of the astronomical staff stepped up to his side. Perfectly safe, he nodded, although even at this distance a star going nova ought to be quite a display. Benedict didn't shift his gaze from the plate. Do you have your instruments set up? Not quite, but we have plenty of time. The light won't reach us for several hours yet. Remember, we were outracing it at ten lights. The commander finally turned, slowly letting his breath out in a soft sigh. <sighs> Dr. Leitcher, I would say that this is just about the foulest coincidence that could happen to the first interstellar vessel ever to leave the solar system. Leitcher shrugged. One way of thinking, yes, it is certainly true that we will never know now whether Alpha Centauri A ever had any planets. But in another way it is extremely fortunate that we should be so near a stellar explosion because of the wealth of scientific information we can obtain. As you say, it is a coincidence and probably one that happens only once in a billion years. The chances of any particular star going nova are small. That we should be so close when it happens is of a vanishingly small order of probability. Commander Benedict took off his cap and looked at the damp stain in the sweatband. Nevertheless, Doctor, it is damned unnerving to come out of ultra-drive a couple of hundred million miles from the first star ever visited by man and have to turn tail and run because the damn thing practically blows up in your face. Leitcher could see that Benedict was upset. He rarely used the same profanity twice in one sentence. They had been downright lucky at that. If Leitcher hadn't seen the star begin to swell and brighten, if he hadn't known what it meant, or if Commander Benedict hadn't been quick enough in shifting the ship back into ultra-drive, Leitcher had a vision of an incandescent cloud of gaseous metal that had once been a spaceship. The intercom buzzed. The commander answered. Yes? Sir, would you tell Dr. Leitcher that we have everything set up now? Leitcher nodded and turned to leave. I guess we have nothing to do now but wait. When the light from the Nova did come, Commander Benedict was back at the plate again, the forward one this time, since the ship had been turned around in order to align the astronomy lab in the nose with the star. Alpha Centauri A began to brighten and spread. It made Benedict think of a light bulb connected through a rheostat, with someone turning that rheostat, turning it until the circuit was well overloaded. The light began to hurt Benedict's eyes even at that distance, and he had to cut down the receptivity in order to watch. After a while he turned away from the plate. Not because the show was over, but simply because it had slowed to a point beyond which no change seemed to take place to the human eye. Five weeks later, much to Leitcher's chagrin, Commander Benedict announced that they had to leave the vicinity. The ship had been provisioned to go to Alpha Centauri, scout the system without landing on any of the planets, and return. At ten lights, top speed for the ultra-drive, it would take better than three months to get back. I know you'd like to watch it go through the complete cycle, Benedict said, but we can't go back home as a bunch of starved skeletons. Leitcher resigned himself to the necessity of leaving much of his work unfinished, and although he knew it was a case of sour grapes, consoled himself with the thought that he could at least get most of the remaining information from the 500-inch telescope on Luna four years from then. As the ship slipped into the not-quite space through which the ultra-drive propelled it, Leitcher began to consolidate the material he had gathered. 
Commander Benedict wrote in the log. Fifty-four days out from Saul, Alpha Centauri has long since faded back into its pre-blown-up state, since we have far outdistanced the light from its explosion. It now looks as it did two years ago. It— Pardon me, Commander, Leitcher interrupted, but I have something interesting to show you. Benedict took his fingers off the keys and turned around in his chair. What is it, Doctor? Leitcher frowned at the papers in his hands. I've been doing some work on the probability of that explosion happening just as it did, and I've come up with some rather frightening figures. As I said before, the probability was small. A little calculation has given us some information which makes it even smaller. For instance, with a possible error of plus or minus two seconds, Alpha Centauri A began to explode the instant we came out of ultradrive. Now the probability of that occurring comes out so small that it should happen only once in ten to the four hundred sixty-seven seconds. It was Commander Benedict's turn to frown. So? Commander, the entire universe is only about ten to the seventeenth seconds old. But to give you an idea, uh, let's say that the chances of it happening are once in millions of trillions of years. Benedict blinked. The number, he realized, was totally beyond his comprehension, or anyone else's. Well, so what? Now it has happened that one time. That simply means that it will almost certainly never happen again. True, but, Commander, when you buck odds like that and win, the thing to do is look for some factor that is cheating in your favor. If you took a pair of dice and started throwing sevens one right after another for the next couple of thousand years, you'd begin to suspect they were loaded. Benedict said nothing. He just waited expectantly. There is only one thing that could have done it. Our ship. Leitcher said it quietly, without emphasis. What we know about the hyperspace or superspace or whatever it is we move through in ultradrive is almost nothing. Coming out of it so near to a star might set up some sort of shock wave in normal space which would completely disrupt that star's internal balance, resulting in the liberation of unimaginably vast amounts of energy, causing that star to go nova. We can only assume that we ourselves were the fuse that set off that nova. Benedict stood up slowly. When he spoke, his voice was a choking whisper. You mean the sun, Saul, might— Leitcher nodded. I don't say that it definitely would. But the probability is that we were the cause of the destruction of Alpha Centauri A— and therefore might cause the destruction of Saul in the same way. Benedict's voice was steady again. That means that we can't go back again, doesn't it? Even if we're not positive, we can't take the chance. Not necessarily. We can get fairly close before we cut our drive and come in the rest of the way at sublight speed. It'll take longer, and we'll have to go on half or one-third rations, but we can do it. How far away? I don't know what the maximum distance is, but I do know how we can gauge a distance. Remember, neither Alpha Centauri B or C were detonated. We'll have to cut our drive at least as far away from Sol as they are from A. I see. The commander was silent for a moment, then. Very well, Dr. Leiter, if that's the safest way, that's the only way. Benedict issued the orders, while Leitcher figured the exact point at which they must cut out the drive, and how long the trip would take. The rations would have to be cut down accordingly. Commander Benedict's mind whirled around the monstrousness of the whole thing like some dizzy bee around a flower. What if there had been planets around Centauri A? Eh? What if they had been inhabited? Had he, all unwittingly, killed entire races of living, intelligent beings? 
But how could he have known? The drive had never been tested before. It couldn't be tested inside the solar system. It was too fast. He and his crew had been volunteers, knowing that they might die when the drive went on. Suddenly Benedict gasped and slammed his fist down on the desk before him. Leitcher looked up. What's the matter, Commander? Suppose, came the answer, just suppose that we have the same effect on a star when we go into ultra-drive as we do when we come out of it. Leitcher was silent for a moment, stunned by the possibility. There was nothing to say, anyway. They could only wait. A little more than half a light year from Sol, when the ship reached the point where its occupants could see the light that had left their home sun more than seven months before, they watched it become suddenly, horribly brighter. A hundred thousand times brighter. End of Time Fuse by Randall Garrett Heist Job on Thizar by Randall Garrett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Heist Job on Thizar by Randall Garrett This story was first published in Amazing Stories, October 1956 Anson Drake sat quietly in the flame bird room of the Royal Grandal Hotel, listening to the alien but soothing strains of the native orchestra and sipping a drink. He knew perfectly well that he had no business displaying himself in public on the planet Thizar. There were influential Thizarians who held no love for a certain Earthman named Anson Drake. It didn't particularly bother Drake. Life was danger, and danger was life to him, and Anson Drake was known on half a hundred planets as a man who could take care of himself. Even so, he wouldn't have bothered to come if it had not been for the fact that Viren Belgazod was a pompous braggart. Belgazod had already suffered at the hands of Anson Drake. Some years before, a narcotics gang had been smashed high, wide, and handsome on Thizar. Three men had died from an overdose of their own thionite drug, and fifty thousand credits of illicit gain had vanished into nowhere. The Thizarian police didn't know who had done the job, and they didn't know who had financed the ring. But Belgazad knew that Anson Drake was the former and Drake knew that Viren Belgazad was the latter, and each one was waiting his chance to get the other. A week before, Drake had been relaxing happily on a beach at Celadon II, twelve light years from Thizar, reading a news fax. He had become interested in an article which told of the sentencing of a certain lady to seven years in Celadon prison when his attention was attracted by another headline. Viron Belgazad buys Algol necklace. Thizar, GNS. Viron Belgazad, wealthy Thizarian financier, has purchased the fabulous necklace of Algol. It was announced today. The necklace made of matched star diamonds is estimated to be worth more than a million credits, although the price paid by Belgazad is not known. Such an interesting bit seemed worthy of further investigation, so Drake had immediately booked passage on the first spaceship to Thizar. And thus it was that an immaculately dressed, broad-shouldered, handsome young man sat quietly in the flame-bird room of Thizar's flushiest hostelry, surveying his surroundings with steady green eyes, and wondering how he was going to get his hands on the necklace of Algol. The police couldn't touch Belgazad, but Anson Drake could, and would. "'Hello, Drake,' said a cold voice at his elbow. Drake turned and looked up into the sardonically smiling face of Jomis Dobijel, the heavy-set, dark-faced Thizarian who worked with Belgazad. "'Well, well,' 
Anson said, smiling. If it is that little Bo Peep, how is the dope business? And how is the big dope himself? Dobigel's smile soured. You're very funny, Earthmen, but we don't like Earthmen here. Do sit down, Doby, and tell me all about it. The last I heard, which was three hours ago, the government of Thizar was perfectly happy to have me here. In fact, they were good enough to stamp my passport to prove it. Dobigel pulled out a chair and sat down, keeping his hands beneath the table. What are you doing here, Drake? he asked in a cold voice. I couldn't help it, Drake said blandly. I was drawn back by the memory of the natural beauties of your planet, the very thought of the fat, flabby face of old Belgazad, with a bulbous nose that is renowned throughout the galaxy, was irresistible. So here I am. Dobigel's dark face grew even darker. I know you, Drake, and I know why you're here. Tomorrow is the date for the coronation of his serenity, the Shan of Thizar. True, Drake agreed, and I wouldn't miss it for all the loot in Andromeda. A celebration like that is worth traveling parsecs to see. Dobigel leaned across the table. Belgazad is a noble of the realm, he said slowly. He'll be at the coronation. You know he's going to wear the necklace of Algol as well as anyone, and you— Suddenly he leaned forward a little farther, his right hand stabbing out toward Drake's leg beneath the table. But Anson Drake was ready for him. Dobigel's hand was a full three inches from Drake's thigh when a set of fingers grasped his wrist in a vice-like hold. Steely fingers bit in, pressing nerves against bone. With a gasp, Dobigel opened his hand. A small metallic cylinder dropped out. Drake caught it with his free hand and smiled. That's impolite, Doby. It isn't proper to try to give your host an injection when he doesn't want it. Casually, he put the cylinder against his arm, which he still held, and squeezed the little metal tube. There was a faint pop drake released the arm and handed back the cylinder dobigel's face was white i imagine that was a twelve-hour poison drake said kindly if you hurry old belgazad will give you the antidote it will be painful but he shrugged and by the way brother dobigel he continued let me give you some advice the next time you try to get near a victim with one of those things don't do it by talking to him about things he already knows. It doesn't distract him enough. Dobigel stood up, his fists clenched. I'll get you for this, Drake. Then he turned and stalked off through the crowd. No one had noticed the little byplay. Drake smiled seraphically and finished his drink. Dobigel was going to be uncomfortable for a while. Twelve-hour poison was a complex protein substance that could be varied in several thousand different ways, and only an antidote made from the right variation would work for each poison. If the antidote wasn't given, the victim died within twelve hours. And even if the antidote was given, getting over poison wasn't any fun at all. Reflecting happily on the plight of Jomis Dobigel, Anson Drake paid his bill, tipped the waiter liberally, and strolled out of the Flamebird room and into the lobby of the Royal Gondil Hotel. The coronation would begin early tomorrow, and he didn't want to miss the beginning of it. The Shan's coronation was the affair of Thizar. He went over to the robot news vendor and dropped a coin in the slot. The reproducer hummed, and a freshly printed news fax dropped out. He headed for the lift tube, which whisked him up to his room on the 81st floor. He inserted his key in the lock and pressed the button on the tip. The electronic lock opened, and the door slid into the wall. Before entering, Drake took a look at the detector on his wrist. There was no sign of anything having entered the room since he had left it, 
Only then did he go inside. With one of the most powerful financiers on Thizar out after his blood, there was no way of knowing what might happen, and therefore no reason to take chances. There were some worlds where Anson Drake would no more have stayed in a public hotel than he would have jumped into an atomic furnace, especially if his enemy was a man as influential as Belgazod. But Thizar was a civilized and reasonably well-policed planet. The police were honest and the courts were just. Even Belkazad couldn't do anything openly. Drake locked his door, sang to himself in a pleasant baritone while he bathed, put on his pajamas and lay down on his bed to read the paper. It was mostly full of coronation news. Noble so-and-so would wear such-and-such, such. the archbishop would do thus-and-so. There was another item about Belkazad. His daughter was ill and would be unable to attend. Bloody shame, thought Drake. Too bad Belgazad isn't sick or dying. There was further mention of the necklace of Algol. It was second only to the crown jewels of the Shan himself. The precautions being taken were fantastic. At a quick guess, about half the crowd would be policemen. The door announcer chimed. Drake sat up and punched the door TV. The screen showed the face of a girl standing at his door. Drake smiled in appreciation. She had dark brown hair, brown eyes, and a smooth tanned complexion. It was a beautiful face, and it showed promise of having a body to match. Who, may I ask, is calling on a gentleman at this ungodly hour and thus compromising her reputation and fair name? The girl smiled, showing even white teeth, and her eyes sparkled, showing flickers of little golden flames against the brown. "'I see I've found the right room,' she said. "'That voice couldn't belong to anyone but Anson Drake.' Then she lowered her voice and said softly, "'Let me in. I'm Norma Knight.' Drake felt a tingle of psychic electricity flow over his skin. There was a promise of danger and excitement in the air. Norma Knight was known throughout this whole sector of the galaxy as the cleverest jewel thief the human race had ever spawned. Drake had never met her, but he had definitely heard of her. He touched the admission stud and the door slid silently aside. There was no doubt about it. Her body did match her face. Do come in, Norma, he said. She stepped inside, and Drake touched the closing button. The door slid shut behind her. She stood there for a moment, looking at him, and Drake took the opportunity to study the girl more closely. At last, she said, So you're Anson Drake. You're even better looking than I've heard you were. Congratulations. I have a good press agent, Drake said modestly. What's on your mind? He waved his hand at a nearby chair. The same thing that's on yours, I suspect, she said. Do you have a drink to spare? Drake unlimbered himself from the bed, selected a bottle from the menu, and dialed. The robot bellhop whirred. A chute opened in the wall, and a bottle slid out. Drake poured, handed the tumbler to the girl, and said, this is your party. What do you have in mind? The girl took a sip of her drink before she answered. Then she looked up at Drake with her deep brown eyes. Two things. One, I have no intention or desire to compete with Anson Drake for the necklace of Algol. Both of us might end up in jail with nothing for our pains. Two, I have a foolproof method of getting the necklace, but none for getting it off the planet. I think you probably have a way. Drake nodded. I dare say I could swing it. How does it happen that you don't have an avenue of disposal planned? She looked bleak for a moment. The man who was to help me decided to back out at the last minute. He didn't know what the job was, and I couldn't tell him because I didn't trust him. 
And you trust me? Her eyes were very trustful. I've heard a lot about you, Drake. And I happen to know you never double-cross anyone unless they double-cross you first. Trade about is fair play, to quote an ancient maxim, Drake said, grinning. And I'm a firm believer in fair play. But that's neither here nor there. The point is, what do you have to offer? Why shouldn't I just pinch the gems myself and do a quick flit across the galaxy? That would give me all the loot. She shook her head. Belgazad is on to you, you know. He knows you're here. His own private police and the Shan's own guard will be at the coronation to protect all that jewelry. She cocked her pretty head to one side and looked at him. What's between you and Belgazad anyway? I stole his toys when he was a child, said Drake, and he hasn't trusted me since. How do you propose to get the necklace of Algol if I can't? She smiled and shook her head slowly. That would be telling. You let me take care of my part, and I'll let you take care of yours. Drake shook his head, not so slowly. Absolutely not. We either work together, or we don't work at all. The girl frowned in thought for a moment, and then reached into the belt pouch at her side, and pulled out a square of electro-engraved plastic. She handed it to Drake. Underneath all the flowery verbiage it boiled down to an invitation to attend the post-coronation reception. It was addressed to Miss Caroline Smith, and was signed and sealed by the Shan of Thizar himself. "'I'm Caroline Smith,' she said. "'I've managed to get in good with the family of Belgazad, and he wrangled the invitation. "'Now the plan is this.' Right after the invocation, while the new Shan is being prepared in his special coronation robes, the nobles will have to change their uniforms from red to green. Belgazad will go into his suite in the palace to change. He'll be accompanied by two guards. One will stay on the outside, the other will help Belgazad dress. I've got the room next to his, and I've managed to get the key that unlocks the door between them. I'll use this. She pulled a small globe of metal from her belt pouch. It's a sleep gas bomb. It'll knock them out for at least twenty minutes. No one will come in during that time, and I'll be able to get the necklace and get out of the palace before they wake up. They'll know you did it, Drake pointed out. If you're still missing when they come to, the thief's identity will be obvious. She nodded. That's where you come in. I'll simply go out into the garden and throw it over the wall to you. We'll meet here afterwards. Drake thought it over and smiled devilishly. It sounds fine. Now let's coordinate everything. They went over the whole plot again, this time with a chart of the palace to mark everything out and a time schedule was arranged. Then they toasted to success and the girl left. When she was gone, Anson Drake smiled ruefully to himself and opened a secret compartment in his suitcase. From it he removed a long strand of glittering jewels. A perfect imitation, Drake said. And you're very pretty. It's a shame I won't be able to hang you around the neck of Belkazad in place of the real necklace of Algol. But his original plan had been more dangerous than the present one, and Anson Drake was always ready to desert a good plan for a better one. Coronation Day dawned bright and clear, and the festivities began early. There were speeches and parades and dancing in the streets. A huge fleet of high-flying rockets rumbled high in the stratosphere, filling the sky with the white traceries of their exhausts. For all of Thizar was on a holiday, a day of rejoicing and happiness. Cheers for the Shan filled the streets, and strains of music came from the speakers of the public communication system. Anson Drake missed most of the fun. He was too busy making plans. The day passed as he worked. The Tsar's sun began to set as the hour for the actual crowning of the Shan approached. 
At the proper time, Drake was waiting in the shadows outside the palace walls. There were eyes watching him, and he knew it, but he only smiled softly to himself and waited. Psst! It was the girl on the other side of the wall. I'm here, whispered Drake. Something that glittered faintly in the soft light of the twin moons of Thizar arced over the wall. Drake caught it in his hands. The Necklace of Algol. He slipped it into a small plastic box he was carrying, and then glanced at the detector on his wrist. The screen showed a pale blue pip, which indicated that someone was hidden in the shadows a few yards to his right. Drake didn't even glance toward the spy. He put the plastic box containing the necklace into his belt pouch and strode away from the palace. He had, he figured, about twenty minutes. He headed directly for the spaceship terminal. Never once did he look back, but the detector on his wrist told him that he was being closely followed. Excellent! Inside the terminal, he went directly to the baggage lockers. He found one that was empty, inserted a coin, and opened it. From his pouch he took a plastic box, put it in the locker, switched on the lock with his key, and strolled away. He glanced again at the detector. He was no longer being followed by the same man. Another had taken up the trail. It figured, it figured. He went straight to the Hotel Gondel making sure that his tail didn't lose him. Not until they were in the lobby did he make any attempt to shake the man who was following him. He went into the bar, ordered a drink, and took a sip. He left his change and the drink on the bar and headed out the door in the direction of the men's room. Whoever was following him wouldn't realize for a minute or two that he was leaving for good. A man doesn't usually leave change and an unfinished drink in a bar. Drake took the lift tube up to his room, attended to some unfinished business, and waited. Less than three minutes later, the door was opened. In walked Viron Belgazad and his lieutenant, Jarnus Dobigel. Both of them looked triumphant, and they were surrounded by a squad of royal police. There he is, said Dobigel. Arrest him. A police officer stepped forward. "'Anson Drake, I arrest you in the name of the Shan,' he said. Drake grinned. "'On what charge?' "'The theft of the Necklace of Algol.' Drake looked directly at Belgazad. "'Did old Fartface here say I took it?' "'You can't talk that way,' Dobijel snarled, stepping forward. "'Who says so, ugly?' At that, Dobigel stepped forward and threw a hard punch from his shoulder straight at Drake's face. It never landed. Drake sidestepped it and brought a smashing uppercut up from his knees. It lifted Dobigel off his feet and sent him crashing back against old Belgazad, toppling them both to the floor. The policemen had all drawn their guns, but Drake was standing placidly in the middle of the room his hands high above his head, regarding the scene calmly. "'I'll go quietly,' he said. "'I've got no quarrel with the police.' One of the officers led him out into the hall, while the other searched his room. Belgazad was sputtering incoherently. Another policeman was trying to wake up Dobigel. "'If you're looking for the necklace of Algol,' Drake said, "'you won't find it there.' The captain of the police squad said— we know that, Mr. Drake. We're merely looking for other evidence. We already have the necklace. He reached in his belt pouch and took out a small plastic box. He opened it, disclosing a glittering rope of jewels. You were seen depositing this in a baggage locker at the spaceship terminal. We have witnesses who saw you, and we had it removed under police supervision. Viren Belgazad smiled nastily. This time you won't get away, Drake. Stealing anything from the palace of the Shan carries a minimum penalty of twenty years in Thizar prison. Drake said nothing as they took him off to the royal police station and locked him in a cell. 
It was late afternoon of the next day when the prosecutor of the Shan visited Drake's cell. He was a tall, imposing man, and Drake knew him by reputation as an honest, energetic man. "'Mr. Drake,' he said as he sat down in a chair in the cell, "'you have refused to speak to anyone but me. I am, of course, perfectly willing to be of any assistance, but I am afraid I must warn you that any statement made to me will be used against you at the trial.' Drake leaned back in his own chair. One thing nice about Thizar, he reflected. They had comfortable jails. My lord prosecutor, he said, I'd like to make a statement. As I understand it, Belgazad claims he was gassed along with a police guard who was with him. When he woke up, the necklace was gone. He didn't see his assailant. That is correct, said the prosecutor. Drake grinned. That was the way it had to be. Belgazad couldn't possibly have bribed the cop, so they both had to be gassed. If he didn't see his assailant, how does he know who it was? You were followed from the palace by Jomis Dobijel, who saw you put the necklace into the baggage locker. There are several other witnesses to that. Drake leaned forward. Let me point out, my lord prosecutor, that the only evidence you have that I was anywhere near the palace is the word of Jomis Dobijel, and he didn't see me inside the palace. I was outside the wall. The prosecutor shrugged. We admit the possibility of an assistant inside the walls of the palace, he said. We are investigating that now. But even if we never find your accomplice, we have proof that you were implicated, and that is enough. What proof do you have? Drake asked blandly. Why, the necklace itself, of course. The prosecutor looked as though he suspected Drake of having taken leave of his senses. Drake shook his head. That necklace is mine. I can prove it. It was made for me by a respectable jeweler on Celadon too. It's a very good imitation, but it's a phony. They aren't diamonds. They're simply well-cut crystals of titanium dioxide. Check them if you don't believe me. The Lord Prosecutor looked dumbfounded. But wh what? Why? Drake looked sad. I brought it to give to my good friend, the noble Belgazad. Of course it would be a gross insult to wear them at the Shan's coronation, but he could wear them at other functions. And how does my good friend repay me? By having me arrested. My Lord Prosecutor, I am a wronged man. The prosecutor swallowed heavily and stood up. The necklace has, naturally, been impounded by the police. I shall have the stones tested. You'll find they're phonies, Drake said. And that means one of two things. Either they are not the ones stolen from Belgazad, or else Belgazad has mortally insulted his Sean by wearing false jewels to the coronation. Well, we shall see about this said the Lord Prosecutor. Anson Drake, free as a lark, was packing his clothes in his hotel room when the announcer chimed. He punched the TV pickup and grinned. It was the girl. When the door slid aside, she came in, smiling. You got away with it, Drake. Wonderful. I don't know how you did it, but did what? Drake looked innocent. Get away with the necklace, of course. I don't know how it happened that Dobuja was there, but— But, 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 Drake said, smiling. You don't seem to know very much at all, do you? Wh what do you mean? Drake put his last article of clothing in his suitcase and snapped it shut. I'll probably be searched pretty thoroughly when I get to the spaceport, he said coolly, but they won't find anything on an innocent man. "'Where is the necklace?' she asked in a throaty voice. Drake pretended not to hear her. "'It's a funny thing,' he said. "'Old Belgazad would never let the necklace out of his hands except to get me. He thought he'd get it back by making sure I was followed. But he made two mistakes.' 
The girl put her arms around his neck. His mistakes don't matter as long as we have the necklace, do they? Anson Drake was never a man to turn down an invitation like that. He held her in his arms and kissed her, long and lingeringly. When he broke away, he went on as though nothing had happened. Two mistakes. The first one was thinking up such an obviously silly plot. If it were as easy to steal jewels from the palace as all that, nothing would be safe on Thizar. The second mistake was sending his daughter to trap me. The girl gasped and stepped back. It was very foolish of you, Miss Belgazad, he went on calmly. You see, I happen to know that the real Norma Knight was sentenced to seven years in Celadon prison over a week ago. Unfortunately, the news hasn't reached Thizar yet. I knew from the first that the whole thing would be a frame-up. It's too bad that your father had to use the real Declus. It's a shame he lost it. The girl's eyes blazed. You... you thief! You... She used words which no self-respecting lady is supposed to use. Drake waited until she had finished and then said, Oh, no, Miss Belgazad, I'm no thief. Your father then consider the loss of that necklace as a fine for running narcotics. And you can tell him that if I catch him again, it will be worse. I don't like his kind of slime, and I'll do my best to get rid of them. That's all, Miss B. It was nice knowing you. He walked out of the room, leaving her to stand there in helpless fury. His phony necklace had come in handy, after all. The police had thought they had the real one, so they had never bothered to check the Galactic Mail Service for a small package mailed to Celadon too. All he'd had to do was drop it into the mail chute from his room and then cool his heels in jail while the Galactic Mails got rid of the loot for him. The necklace of Algol would be waiting for him when he got to Celadon too. End of Heist Job on Thizar End of The Man Who Hated Mars by Randall Garrett